Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Each week, our hosts will be interviewing local, regional, and national business leaders to give you an inside peek into how they lead their business to success in the ever-competitive business climate. Today's episode is a little bit different. Today's guest is none other than yours truly, me, Lance Psycho, your co-host here at Inside the Firm Podcast, Mr. Serial Entrepreneur, Architect, and Developer himself, and the co-founder of F9 Productions. Last week, I gave a presentation to the National Organization of Minority Architecture Students up at my alma mater at North Dakota State University, and my presentation focused on the unique hurdles faced by minority architects in the industry from navigating systematic barriers to finding your voice in a traditionally homogenous field. I shared my personal experiences, my practical strategies, and valuable advice to inspire and empower the next generation of minority architects. This talk also highlighted the importance of resilience, mentorship, and breaking victimhood stereotypes while pursuing a successful career in architecture. So without further ado, here's me. Cool, thank you. <laughs> Are we recording on Zoom? We're good? Okay, cool. Well, good evening. Uh, yeah, I'm here to talk about challenges of becoming a minority architect. I am a minority. I'm a federally registered Native American with the Turtle Mountain Band and Chippewa Indians. Um, but this presentation, I want to make it clear, is it's actually for everybody. Because at the base of this whole thing, really, is just fundamental stuff that some of the most successful people that I know, that I admire, and I think of myself as a, as a successful person, uh, just do on a daily basis to succeed. And I'm trying to strip away some of, some of the myths, I think, that like there's this big privilege that this uh, one group of people has versus this other people have, and sometimes that does occur, but there's always a yin and yang to everything, okay? So for anybody who doesn't know me, I do see a lot of familiar faces here. Uh, my name is Lance, last name is actually Purdue Psycho. Uh, I taught two studios last year, the urban design studio, and then a third year studio. I uh, wasn't able to teach this year just through a variety of different reasons. But I have become now a donor to the NOMA organization here, um, and now I'm back to kind of give this presentation and hopefully back again uh, this spring. I also own an architecture firm, F9 Productions Inc., out of uh, Denver and Longmont, Colorado, a real estate development firm, F12 Productions, and then a construction company called F14 Productions. So I probably do a little bit of too many things. And I think this is on. mentioned uh, the Native American tribe that I'm a part of, and some people might not know where even that's, that's from, right? Uh, so this map is actually from my thesis that I did here at North Dakota State. I'm a 2008 uh, North Dakota State grad as well. I won the Peter F. McKinley Thesis Award, and uh, I based my thesis on my background in North Dakota, growing up in the environment I did, um, and the environment that I grew up in is over here in Trenton, North Dakota. And the significance of that for me is that the tribe, the main tribe is up here, and that's where most of the services are for, for, for my people, right? Like the socialized medicine, the socialized health care, um, any kind of extra help that we needed in that kind of a way. And we became sort of this bastardized version of the tribe. Um, our original chief that I found out about during my thesis, re during my thesis research was Little Shell, and we're sort of this forgotten place over here. Um, but I made it all the way back over here eventually. Um, and then I went to North Dakota State School of Science in Wapaton for two years, getting a degree in building construction technology. And I was so, I was finally for the first time after growing up in that little tiny town, I got to pick what I wanted to do. And I just loved school. And all of a sudden I was like, well, I know how to build a thing. Like, maybe I should know how to draw a thing. Um, so I looked up North Dakota State. They had something I'll talk about later, which was a culture diversity tuition waiver for me. I didn't want to be one of these people that had a mountain of debt coming out of school. I was trying to first, you know, set myself up for success, which is something else we'll talk about today. Um, so I applied here, got into the program, and accelerated um, to the top and graduated again. Um, I'm also a, a former NOMA scholar. I remember distinctly looking up the NOMA scholarships when I was a student, um, taking some summer courses, applying. Very thankful that I got them because it helped me um, go through college, even though I was a one of those students that made it I made a mistake and had a child out of wedlock when I was only a sophomore in North Dakota State. So I kind of played myself a bad card that time. 
Uh, but Noma's been really, really good, so I'm, trying to hear, I'm here to try to get back in that capacity. Uh, I was also a Magnair Scholar. Does anybody know what that program is about? I don't think it exists anymore, but it did at one point, and I think it could even re exist remotely if anybody's interested in it. It doesn't just apply to minorities. Um, one of my best Caucasian friends from college, he was a McNair Scholar um, because he could prove he was disadvantaged in a different way. He came from a single, pam single uh, parent family household. Uh, but Ron Ronald E. McNair is, was the, an astronaut who died in the Challenger explosion. And after that, then they set up a uh, scholarship program for him, of which, again, I was thankful for because it allowed me to do two extra theses and I know that sounds daunting, but I got paid to do them. So I, and I got to do them in concert with like studio projects. So I was kind of doubling up on the output I was putting out about the same time actually making money and feeding my child and my future wife. Um, and then on the left hand side here, I just, wanted, I just wanted to say, I put up this graphic like, I actually took a DNA test about 10 years ago um, because I was always confused about even what I was. I mean, I knew I came from the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. I have a piece of paper that says I'm a Native American. It allowed me to go get kind of scholarships and stuff like that. Most of you know, my family's Native and stuff like that. But I found my real dad about 10 years ago. And one thing that always popped up when I would go into a very white area, it's like, especially in North Dakota State. So coming from the western side of the state over to the eastern side, a lot of kids from Minneapolis. I'm gonna pick up my business partner right now and he'll, he's okay with this, is that he's one of the first people to come up to me and go like, what are you? And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you're, well, you're brown. And I'm like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm native. And at that point, that's all I thought it was. And then it turned out, no, you're actually a lot more. Like you're kind of North American Indian, South American Indian, part black down here, some white, all over the place. Now I just say, I'm like the OG Native American. Um, but well, the reason I really put it up is because I just wanted to show it like, we're all complicated. Right? <clears throat> I think that's one of the things that really bugs me, is like when we get judged in that way, it's like, look at all the complication. Like what, what all comes with that DNA, right? Like we're not just these simple creatures. <clears throat> and then on the right hand side, last but certainly not least, um, in 2021 we were honored with the, uh, the Horizon Award at North Dakota State, um, which is an award for young professionals who have demonstrated excellence within their first 15 years coming out of school and have made a significant contribution to their community. So that's probably enough about me now. Let's move on to us, who are we? Um, I put up this slide and this statement by Aristotle because I think that's where we gotta start this conversation. At least that's where I started it for myself, right? It's like knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Super important, super important. You gotta know like who you are your weaknesses, your strengths, your background, where you came from, what your disadvantages are, what your ad advantages are. How am I gonna play the hand of cards that was dealt to me if I don't know who I am, right? So we, we just have to really think about that. Thank you for moving that back. Um, so, whoa, sorry, I did that. Dr drilling, drilling a little bit further down on that, then I was like, well, like, what are the statistics even these days? I kinda know, you know, the percentage of the population of how many people, uh, what percentage are black, what percentage are Hispanic, native, and all that kind of stuff. And how does it like line up with some of the things we're being torn from the corporate media of like, well, are we really, you know, are, is this the percentage of people that are going to school that are minorities, do they, is that reflected in like in real society? And then I was stunned that this number is actually kind of aligned. Um, so while that might seem like a really dismal number, like less than 1% of students are natives, or Alaskan, or American, or Alaskan natives, that's actually pretty congruent with like the regular population, right? So it's not all bad. Uh, less than 8% were Asian, Asian, less than 12, and less than 13% were black or African American, which the typical population in the United States is about 13. So it seems like we're actually trending in, in an okay, okay direction. 20% uh, were Hispanic, less than a quarter was Pacific Islander, which is pretty usual, um, and less than 5% were identified as just a different kind of multiracial. One of the most surprising things that I found was that over half of students now in the United States are female. Did anybody know that coming into this presentation? It's like overwhelming. And I've seen this trend happen in the last 10 years teaching down at CU. The women in the engineering are just accelerating and crushing. And we can debate either way, if that's good or bad, if we're overcorrecting or not. But I think it's, again, just important to understand like who are we and, and what does it mean 
um, for us moving ahead. So then drilling even further, like, okay, what stats are unique to just us minority students, right? And like, what does that mean for how we operate and how we try to succeed and, and thrive? Um, a lot of us are first generation. I was first generation. And that was, that was hard. That was really hard. Because, you know, it's, like you can see the stats up here. It's about a third, about a third of us are first generation. It was hard for me because I couldn't like call mom or dad or grandma or grandpa and say, like, how do I do this? Like, do I go to the registration office? Like, how do I pay? How do I pay the bills? Like, how does how does the, all the FAFSA crap work? What's it like to apply for a scholarship? Nothing like that, right? That was just me recognizing that that part of it, right? And we, we'll talk about the reactions to that later. Um, but I think it's just important to point out, like some of us, that's just a reality of us. Like we don't really get to rely on somebody else that maybe other people do. Um, the other big one I wanted to point out was that a lot of us are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, right? So that might mean, in a negative result, it might mean that like we got to do it. We got to have that extra job. We got to do the McNair's thesis. So we got to do two in a row. A lot of this stuff is just us going like, okay, these are just challenges maybe that we have to overcome. Like this is our existence, right? We could just gnash our teeth about it and be angry and try to point to a certain sect of people, take something from them and give back to whatever we need to to try to make it up. Maybe that's not the solution, right? Um, some more. Black, black and Indian and Alaskan Native kids, right? Most of us, single parent, single parent family households. What does that mean? Well, that means like, there's all kinds of just empirical data that you can go look up at any time on Google right now. Like, what is the difference? What, what happens to kids, students, that come from single family? parents than where they have both people present at all time. There's all there's all, all kinds of positive versus all kinds of negatives that happen, but we're just recognizing that difference. Whereas like our counterparts, right? And this is just empirical data. Tw only 24% of whites, only 20, only 16% of Asian Pacific Islanders, and then kind of bringing it back into the middle, the Latinos are about, about halfway there, about halfway there. It's not the best stats. Um, then I thought that was. Then I was just curious, like, well, what percentage of architects are minorities? It's only about 22% right now. I think the big dismal one, though, is down here, where it's like, man, we've got about 121,000 architects, 21,000 architects in the United States, and only 2% of those are black. Only 2% of those are African American, and out of those, the black women are even more scarce. There's only 566, right? So, while I think, like, you go back to this slide. You can make the argument that like we're starting to reflect society a little bit more, right? But we're definitely not reflecting it here. So there's still more work to do, right? So how do we get through these challenges and 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 get those numbers up to where it's just it's more congruent with reality? Um, does anybody know who this is? Does anybody? No, no one in this room has heard of Marcus Aurelius, besides Ben. Okay, a few people. Good. Um, <laughs> Marcus Aurelius is one of my favorite philosophers, and I, I heard about him for a long time, and but I only read his book maybe four or five years ago. But I've been doing podcast guesting. I was going these. I, I do a podcast, but then I also go on other shows, and I'm a podcast guest. And I was I found myself telling like all these stories about my life, um, and <clears throat> at some point somebody you know pointed me to Marcus Aurelius. I read the book, and the reason I had this this slide up is because I have two slides of Marcus Aurelius. I'm going to recommend this book at the end of this presentation. Um, but this one in particular relates exactly back to those other ones, right? So like, what do we have power over? Do we have power over how we were born? Do we have power over the color of our skin? Do we have power over whether dad left, mom left, we don't have much money, all of those things like that we're born into? No, right? We don't have the power of that. Like, we're not God. That's what was God's gift to us in, in God's way. But what do we have power over? We 100% have power over our mind. Every single day, like, this is what we can control. We can control what happens around us, just very tightly and closely with our friends and our family and our close ones, and we can control ourselves, right? But the externalities, we're not gonna really control. I mean, even if you just, not to get political, but if you think about just any election cycle, right? Yes, you can say the one vote counts in very rare circumstances, but largely that vote is kind of like, well, you did it, I'm not sure it really changed the externalities, right? And in fact, maybe, if you, whoever you voted for doesn't win, and it makes you really angry, and you throw a fit online, 
you don't have control over your mind anymore. So you're, like now you're not in control of anything, right? We have to be able to control our mind because we can't control the outside events. So if you, if you can realize this, then, then that's where you're going to find the strength, okay? <clears throat> the second slide. If we, if we all agree on that, if we all agree on the number one thing that we should be trying to control is ourselves and our mind and our reaction to all of those externalities that we already kind of pointed out or whatever circumstance we're in, then we have to do what Marcus is saying here is, the things you think about determine the quality of your mind, your soul takes on the color of your thoughts. So I want you to think about, when you think about those things that I was pointing out earlier, or maybe, maybe those slides even made you think about other things that were unpleasant, and that maybe you've even developed a little bit of jealousy at a, at a certain counterpart, because you think they have a bigger advantage of you than that, right? How are you painting the color of your soul if you're thinking those negative things? Like probably really dark colors, right? What's the opposite though? What's the opposite if you, if you, if you start painting it with a positive light, right? And that's your focus for, the, for, for, the, for that particular day and how you're gonna move forward. That can dramatically change how you start attacking problems in your life. Professional, personal, all that good stuff. So if, 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 we're, if we're trying to if we agree that the idea of stoicism, and not in the stoicism on those first on those previous slides, is me looking at me looking at uh, you guys and just not saying anything, but it's actually just being stoic in my mind and not um, becoming so caught up in things that I can't control, then we can start talking about the hand of cards. Um, I like to use this metaphor because <laughs> one of the big critiques I have on sort of this. Uh, a lot of what we hear in society, and a lot of it comes from these talking heads in the media, and where I think they want to paint people as victims, um, and then they they think those people are victims, and then they, oh, the only way you can get out of this your situation, victim, A, B, C, whatever you are, is to look for like an external solution, like oh, we need the government to come in and help us, oh, we need some other kind of big agency to come help us, um, or or we need to take from a whole group of people and give it to another set of people, or you know, do something like that, right? Like a negative equals just another negative. Um, so on the left-hand side, if there's any poker players here, is a royal flush. And I know people that have been dealt that hand of cards. I know many people that have been dealt that hand of cards. Some of them are my best friends, they're awesome. But a lot of them, a lot of people I know, including myself, was dealt like this hand. This is a real crappy hand of cards. It's a real crappy hand of cards. But the positive thing about the whole thing is, is like we're all playing the game, right? Right? It's it's not that it's not that we're not playing the game. That's the thing that we really have to make sure we're focused on and that we understand. It's like just because you were dealt the crappy hand of cards doesn't mean you're not playing, and that doesn't mean you can't get all the way over to here eventually. It's again your challenge if you were dealt this real crappy hand of cards. It's your challenge to play that hand almost perfectly. Like you you don't get you don't get afforded this. You don't get afforded that. That's, again, you recognizing like, what was I born into? What is my place in the world? What are even some of the problems I gave to myself, like I told you about when I had my first child out of wedlock in college, right? I gave, I gave myself the two spades over here. I had to like figure out how to play all the way over to an ace in that kind of a way. Another game metaphor I like to talk about is chess. Any chess players? Ben, again? Okay, pop quiz over here then. What happens when you take a pawn and you get it all the way over to the other side of the board. You get a queen, right? Is it, so for people who don't play chess, there's a little chess education. Um, I like to make this metaphor because we've also heard the term pawn a lot, right? Thrown around like, oh, we're all just pawns in this big game. You know, like where there's these billionaires on these yachts or whatever, and we're just, we're just little worker pawns and stuff like that. Good, good, I, I love that. Great, I want to be a pawn. You know why? Because if I take that pawn and get all the way over to the other side of the board, I can be a king or a queen. I'm still playing the game. I'm still playing the game. Uh, through the podcasting, back to that again, when I was I would be interviewed by these various people and they would pull these stories out of me. And uh, a lot of the stories, I would tell these stories about these real negative things that happened to me. But it always ended up with me like saying like, 
But I was so glad that that happened because then this positive thing happened. <clears throat> and I kept telling this over and over and over again. Finally, this one gal pulls me, she, she like stopped me and she goes, you know you're describing the law of polarity. And I was like, oh, that's a real thing? Yeah. So the law of polarity states that everything in the universe has an opposite. The law of polarity helps us understand the difference between positive and negative things we're dealt in our lives so we can recognize what is next to come based on this law, right? It's 100% real. You can't have electricity without a positive and negative charge, right? You can't have like the world that we live in without a sun or a moon. There's gotta be a negative and positive. You can't have the yin and the yang work in that kind of way, right? So knowing that this exists is super important while we're setting up this sort of mental framework of, of who we are, what are, our, what are the negative things that we do or we have been dealt, and then if this is true, where does the positive shift happen? Like, what are we doing to make sure the positive part happens? So one of the things you have to do is you have to be growing on the basics. Um, everybody knows who this is. Elon Musk, the great Elon Musk. Um, when I look at him, and I ask this question, what makes successful people successful? At no point did my brain ever, ever say, well, it's probably because he's a straight white male who got a million dollar loan from his dad, which is the corporate media story. I mean, that's, that's the talking point. Every critic of his is like, that's why he is. But you know why I really think he is? Because he's brilliant at the basics. There was a podcast I was listening to like a week ago, and there was, a, there was this man who was very close to Elon Musk and interviewed him, he's another engineer. And where he proved to me that Elon is brilliant at the basics, and that's why Elon is so good at all the things he does, is he was telling a story about uh, Elon's day-to-day -day base, like what he does at, at, uh, at SpaceX. Elon, and, and why Elon can launch like 10 rockets compared to the next competitor, which is one. Like why is Elon just doing all these iterations, actually making progress? Starlink is happening, all these things. And why, why, why are all these other like Boeing, and, you know, these other huge corporations that have been around forever, why are they so stuffy and just not? And he goes, he's growing at the basics. Because Elon is, even though he's the CEO, he goes all the way from CEO, he still thinks of himself as an engineer, and he goes every day right down to the, like, the lowest level engineers, and he's solving problems with them, like basic problems with them, and then feeding it all the way back up to the system. That's, that's the kind of basic stuff that we're gonna get into like to, to just set the base, and it applies to everybody. Like this has nothing to do with color, race, skin, creed, sex, gender, any of that kind of stuff. That's kind of the point of this whole thing. So <clears throat> one of the first things you can do, and some of this stuff might sound rudimentary and kind of silly, but I want you to have an open mind. And some of you might already be doing this stuff. So the big negative that I dealt myself when I was 20, when I had my first child in, at North Dakota State, was it was like, ah, I might have to drop out of school. Why might I have to drop out of school? How am I even gonna find time to do all of my work with a, with a child and all this other stuff? How am I gonna be able to do that? It was like, well, I gotta make a big life shift. My big life shift was I became an early riser. I, I really started to embrace mornings. And I ended up being the first to studio every single day, or class. And studio, by that I mean like, I was there at six, and I would leave at the very, very end too. It, 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 it absolutely translated it over to all, to all of these things. And, every, and I still do it. I wake up every day between 5, 5.30. My business partner wakes up every day between 5, 5.30. My best employees wake up super early there. They come to work. They leave a little bit early because we allow them to do that. All these other business people that I've interviewed in my whole life, like, morning seemed to be something very, very important to the most successful people in the world. And has, again, it has nothing to do with where you came from. Like, what's stopping you from, from waking up and being a routine person? And look at all the benefits. Improve mental focus, enhance productivity, time for self-care, reduce stress levels, improve mood, your circadian rhythm is aligned, and you've got to keep that going when it comes to studio, right? Like, and, and I only pulled one all-nighter my whole time I was at North Dakota State. And it was because of stuff like this, habits like this, like you can do it. So I'm gonna share with you my morning routine and I want you guys to think about how, how it could translate to your morning routine. You don't have to be just like me. But I, I promise you, almost, I've interviewed like three or 400 very, very successful business, business owners uh, on our show and multiple billionaires, millionaires, in person, on Zoom, the whole thing. Almost every single one of them has a morning routine. Like unequivocally, it's just a thing that they all do. First thing I do when I wake up, big glass of water. Big, fat, giant glass of water and I rehydrate myself. Put on, I start grinding the coffee, put the coffee on, 
Then I start working on my body. Stretch, I loosen up my body, I'm, I'm, I'm expanding my own, my body, right? Getting my blood flowing. Then I go, and for me, I pray the rosary. I'm, I'm meditating in that way. I used to meditate. You could translate that your own version, but now I'm, now I'm expanding my mind and working my mind and loosening up my mind, right? Every single day that I can do this, I do this. At least 300 days out of the year. Then it's finally time for the delicious hot bean. And then I move into something that is super special. And I like to call it the golden hours. So this gal is doing exactly that, right? She's already done, hopefully, some kind of morning routine like that. Maybe for you instead, it's going for a walk, meditating, something else, right? But eventually you're landing here. The golden hours are the golden hours literally and metaphorically, right? So kind of back to that circadian rhythm. The golden hours, like everyone knows because there are due architectural renderings here, are right away in the morning. It's kind of that beautiful light, right? There's just something special about that energy. But they're also golden because nobody bugs you. Like you have all this time to do your most creative work early in the morning if you become an early, early morning person. My best designs, my firm's best designs, my best just business ideas have all come to be mostly in the morning. And what I really, when I know I'm really crushing it in the morning, is like, if I have emails, <clears throat> if I'm getting ahead of everybody else throughout the day, and by the time everybody else shows up for work by seven or eight, if I'm already ahead of pretty much the whole, my whole world, the world's not leading me anymore. Who's leading? Me. Now I'm in charge of it, right? So it's sort of back to that stoicism and taking control of like, what can I control? I started controlling it right away in the morning. Um, after that, it, it, once you're establishing just some, just some basic, good, healthy, healthy living habits and working habits, then it all comes down to discipline, right? Does anybody know who Jocko Willick is? It's gotta be some bros, yeah. Jocko Willick, discipline equals freedom, which sounds like a, it doesn't, that doesn't sound like it makes sense right away, right? But it does, it's like, how could, how could discipline equal freedom? And here's how it does. I, I started this habit too in college, and it was, and it once, especially once I had Kyler, it was like, Boy, I gotta really be intentional with my time. If I'm gonna still try to be a dad, be a scholar, uh, literally a McNair scholar, and do this extra thesis, and try to go after the Peter F. McKinsey Award, all, do all these things, I had a part-time job too, I better be very intentional with my time. And I've never stopped being intentional with my time. Uh, I had uh, this guy message me the other day on Instagram, through my fishing channel, because I do pro fishing on the side. Like we should, uh, I, I told him about how often I was going fishing, like three or four weeks ago or something like that. It was after work. I was like, man, I wish I had your life. And I go, do you? And then I told him all the things I do, and he goes, oh, well, how do you, how do you do it? And I go, I'm intentional with my time. Like that's what I do. So that's what the discipline can equal to freedom. If you're just intentional with your time, then you can carve out space for everybody. You can figure it all out. You can you can you can make it happen. One of my biggest pet peeves, and I don't know if anybody else has this, is when. Somebody gives me the excuse that they're busy. Boy, I hate that. I just hate that because it's not real. It's not that you're not. It's not that you're too busy. It's that you weren't intentional with your time. That's a you problem. That's not a me problem, right? And everybody I know who keeps calendar like this, they're not overwhelmed by it. You might have to come up with your own version in that kind of way. But look at all the stuff I carved time out for. Oh, hunting with cameraman Bill. We were gonna go elk, we went elk hunting and everything. I, even with all this crazy busy schedule, professional, personal, all that stuff, I still managed to go hunting with my best friend. So how, how, how do we get there if we kind of start establishing some of those habits, right? Like how do we get to be a successful architect, whether it's the minority or not, it doesn't matter. Like how do we become these successful um, professionals? And I know I, this is the joke I was making about sitting in the front. Sitting in the front is a big deal. So while everybody else is sitting in the back, your counterparts, I want you to consider after this lecture, sitting up front from now on, from now on. Because empirical data shows that like, you get better engagement, you get better grades, better connection with the instructor. You know what I, would, you know what I did with every single course I took here? It didn't matter how big the lecture was. I would go up, I would sit at the front, because it kept me awake, it kept me engaged, I took notes every single time, I knew the content, I was like present, right? Very, very present. I would go up to the professor, and I would introduce myself day one. Hi, my name is Lance Psycho. I had an icebreaker, so you'd have to figure out your own icebreaker to do that. But like, 
just doing simple stuff like that and showing your presence, then all of a sudden that professor would actually engage with me a little bit more too, right? Like you're paying so much money for this tuition. And I still do this in like professional lectures. Alex and I just went to the Bond conferences. You get invited um, if you do, um, if, you're, if you're sort of in this elite category of like high-end residential and stuff like that. And they had lectures there, sat right in front, went and introduced myself to the guy. Same sort of thing, saw him in the hallway. All of a sudden we had this like relationship going on that we, we like, he knew who I was, right? You never know when like those things can come into play later on in life. Uh, there's less distraction, you have better hearing, better vision, more leg room, easier to get up, you gotta go to the bathroom, whatever you gotta do. Consider sitting in the front. I, I told my children this, I tell my students this, I try to tell everybody that. It makes a giant, giant difference. <clears throat> Another thing that I just gotta emphasize, so like back to those cards, right? If you were dealt the crappy hand of cards, let's say that guy on the right was dealt the crappy hand of cards, and let's say these guys, all these guys were dealt, dealt the royal flush, right? They can afford to party. They can literally afford to party. They can literally afford to be hung over the next day, probably. They can just make, they, it can happen for them, right? Because maybe like they were even afforded because they were given that beautiful hand of cards. Like they only had to take like 12 credits, right? Whereas maybe you got to take an 18. Like you can't afford to do that kind of stuff, right? So just because they have the privilege of doing stuff like that, what is the opposite of that? I, you say to yourself, I don't have that privilege. What, what do I do then? I study. I study my ass off. I never stop. <clears throat> um, this, is a, this is a story about uh, winter break. And it's in between my senior year. It was, uh, it was right before uh, thesis. So it, was, it would have been senior year, right before capstone, that's what it was. Uh, no, no, grad school. Yeah, so it was, it was winter break, grad school. Um, so, Back to sort of like this, this idea of like, what were all my friends doing on that winter break? I remember a lot of them went skiing that year. I remember a lot of them went like to Cancun and stuff like that. And what I did, and what Al Gore did too, is we just made our portfolios like boring college students and did not go skiing and did not go to Cancun because I wasn't dealt that hand of cards, right? I, I also, I obviously dealt myself, remember that two spades? There's Kyler over there, gotta take care of him. I can't go to Cancun, I can't do that stuff. So what do I gotta do? Oh, I gotta build my portfolio. I, while everybody else is doing all that stuff, I'm just gonna make my portfolio. Then, then, then I spent the, the second week of that researching all the firms that I wanted to apply to. This is again, winter break, like so Christmas break. And I targeted three states, Colorado, Oregon, and Montana. We got one interview in Oregon, zero interviews in Montana, but seven interviews in Colorado. Um, when I was researching, <laughs> so one of the things I told them, so look at these ladies, Delta, Delta, they're Royal Flush Plus over here. They're crushing it. They're, it's MTV Spring Break. They're doing it. I couldn't afford that. I didn't want to do that. What I told everybody, why the Spring Break is significant, this is, this is like, I think this, this system works, is after you make your portfolio during that, um, during that winter break and you're researching those firms, the way to get an out-of-state job the easiest, I think, is you have to make it easy on me, the principal. Me, the owner of the firm. I am so busy with intention <laughs> that, that I need you to tell me when you're available, like when you're coming to town for the interview. So that was like a little hack that I did. Uh, and then Alex did too, and he, Alex got like four interviews in New York City. One of them was the studio Daniel Liebskin, and he worked there for, for about a year before he got laid off with the Great Recession. But we were able to get our foot in the door with those very, very busy principals who would just have so much to do and are looking at 100 resumes like every week type of thing. Is I just, I did a couple things. While researching them, it was like, all right, what's my audience? Like I gotta know my audience every time I, I send out a very unique cover letter to these firms. I would give them a compliment. I would, I would talk about something in, in a fair amount of detail that they did. So I didn't just seem like I was just throwing resumes out willy-nilly, right? And then the last thing I would tell them is I, I would love the opportunity to interview with your firm. I will be out in Colorado this week. And it was on spring break. So instead of partying, I went and tried to find a job. That's what I did. That's what you should do. Is this gonna go again? Oh. Yeah. Um, summer break. That's another opportunity for you to sort of 
level the playing field, play your cards a little bit better, maybe get an ace and a king and a queen in your hand. Uh, one of the smartest things that I did, if you guys can, if any of you can afford it, is, and it might sound boring, and I don't know how it's gonna work out with your internships, but you need to try to carve out some space for yourself so you can get obsessive about architecture and architecture school. And the way you're gonna do that is, I would highly recommend, instead of doing the Europe trip, you can still go with Susan in the fall, get your taste, but instead in the summer, I would take at least two extra courses. Because you know what it set me up for when I got to fourth year and fifth year? I only had like 12 credits, credits to take in fourth year in each semester. And then, and then in grad school, I think you can take as low as like eight credits or something like that. My whole focus was so that I could spend as much damn time studying architecture and doing the architecture studio projects as possible. That was me getting an ace, getting a king, getting a queen. And then these guys came back and they were like, 18 credits? Well, I guess I'll be spending much more time in the studio and, and hopefully, you know, winning all the awards and doing all the things, right? Um, once, if, if we're talking about that kind of stuff, the other thing we should talk about is probably scholarships, right? I think one of the most disappointing things that I have uh, against my own people, natives, is that when, when I went to college, I was just blown away at the opportunity. The biggest reason I, I came here was because of this I talked about earlier. It's like, I don't know if these still exist, but they did when I was here. And, but I'm pointing this out just to point out opportunities. Like, you've got to look for your opportunities. Like, you've got to look for, like, well, my counterparts can't get this, but I can get this. What does that mean? That bought me a bunch of freedom. That means maybe I don't have to do the part-time job or the full-time job or something like that. Now, all of a sudden, my tuition is way. I had a cultural diversity tuition waiver at North Dakota State. It was huge for me. Because then when I applied for the scholarships and won a bunch, including one from NOMA, that was just money in my pocket and I could pay rent. I didn't have to do, I, did, I could spend more time in studio, I could spend more time on academics, right? Like you're buying yourself some freedom with all of this stuff. I did a quick chat GPT search for this. This took me like 30 seconds. I have paid chat GPT for it just so it's better, but I was like, look up all of the scholarships that are applicable to minorities in America. And it spit out like 50 of or like 40 of them right away, right? Do you know how long this actually took me when I, when I took that summer off of work. And so what I did that one summer is I, I took the extra courses and then I would go sit in the lab, in the RCDC lab, and I would look up any, just any scholarship that could possibly apply to me as a, as, a NOMA, as a NOMA kind of student, right? Especially Native American. And I applied to as many of them as I could. And I think one year I ended up making like 30 grand or something, and no joke. Like I really, really went after it. And then it carved out all the time for me. So if, if you're sitting here, and maybe you're, you know, second, third year, fourth year, and you haven't done this yet, you should do that. Like, it's money that is allocated for you, especially, especially for minority, there's a huge set of sides. And that's, again, why, like, for me, I was like, man, like, I, I grew up with all these other Native Americans, and I'm like, why aren't they taking advantage of this stuff? It seems like it's a layup, it's just crazy to me, right? Um, so that's why I brought up this slide, because, like, my mom and dad used to say the first part all the time, um, right? How do we get there? We, we get there, we're trying to buy freedom. The money is buying us freedom. Like that is what money buys you, it buys you freedom. My mom and dad used to always say this. They used to say, having money isn't everything, period. Period. And I hated it. I hated it because it felt like self-defeating. And I was like, ah, oh. and they're not entrepreneurs like me. You know, dad was just, oh, dad's a farmer, God bless him. Thank God he farmed. Like I'm very thankful for that upbringing. He saved the farm. We still have the farm. Um, Mom is a dental assistant. I didn't make very much money at Indian Health Service, so it's even worse pay, um, stuff like that. But then my favorite rapper one day, about 10 years ago, said, not having it is. I'm like, oh, God, that really hits me. That hits me. It's not because I want all these possessions. I want the freedom. And I recognize that, like, oh, that's what I bought myself with all those scholarships. Because you know what it allowed me to do? It allowed me to be, do that. It allowed me to be completely obsessed with the practice, with the practice of architecture in college and put in my 10,000 hours. I was so bad second year. I was even, I thought I was even bad. I had Bacher third year. He'll say I'm good, I, I, I disagree. I think I was horrible, right? Finally, a fourth year, after putting in and buying myself the time to be able to literally just like 
just design and design and design and look at all the books and just pound it into my head. Because I also came from a background too of building, which is kind of not the best to come from if you're trying to do the really cool foo-foo architecture that's you know ethereal and all that kind of stuff. Like I had to sort of break out of this mental these mental chains, I would say. Um, so that's that's why you got and again, if 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 you're in the audience, you're like, oh well, I, I can't get into those scholarships or anything like that. There's all kinds of other opportunities for you. The whole point is you need to make this happen for yourself. You need to understand that like not having it is everything, right? Especially in academia, because then think about all the compound interest that comes down afterwards if you end up taking out these loans. Like you gotta really take this stuff seriously. So how so how do you how do you set yourself up for that? I, I told you about how I did, you can figure out how, how you did, right? Um, the other thing I think you need to have is you need to have some kind of a vision. Um, for me, this is from my thesis. Uh, it's called that was my entry slide when I presented here. My project was called Trenton 2020. The little tagline is does every small town in North Dakota have to dwindle away? <coughs> My reaction to that situation, to that negative situation, and all, everything I had been hearing about the town I grew up in, this bastardized tribe, um, the town like 10, 10 miles away from us, like uh, was about 10, 13,000 people at that point in Williston. Like we were looked down on, we were just trash over here. Um, and then I also had heard, heard this over and over again in North Dakota, up until the oil boom. Like, oh, we're just a dying state, population's going away. Nothing good is going to happen. It's all downhill from here. And I was like, there's got to be an opposite to this. This was even before I thought about the law of polarity. And I've just always kind of been that contrarian. So encouraging you guys to have that too. When you see a negative, like, how can I turn this into a positive? Like, there's got to be some positive part to this, right? Um, so if, if, if you are a minority, the one of the things I think you do have an advantage on possibly when it comes down to your thesis or a project like this is, you can tug at bleeding hearts. Why can you tug at bleeding hearts? Because maybe you grew up in a crappy place like I did, essentially like a rural ghetto, and I went and tried to improve the whole thing with my thesis. It was this beautiful, socio-cultural, much bigger than architecture. There was landscape architecture, there was urban planning, there was manufacturing. We incorporated the town. We formed our, a whole new tribe called the Western Band of Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. I mean, it was this vast, extensive thing, right? I took all that negative stuff. I was like, no, we're just to make it positive. Like, I believe this is actually a beautiful place, right? I think that's where actually some of us maybe have an, uh, the people who were dealt that crappy hand of cards on the right maybe actually have an advantage. Because you can play that two of spades, that three of hearts or whatever, in a different kind of way, right? For your, know your audience. Like, what is your audience looking for? You might have an advantage there. So try to have some vision with those final projects at North Dakota State. Uh, I was telling Maddie, I was talking to Maddie, um, it's probably, nobody's gonna take my degree away, so I'm, I'm okay to say this, but like, I was talking to Maddie upstairs uh, in fourth year, and she was telling me about urban design, how it's going and everything, and I didn't like urban design when I went, went here, just because we didn't get to do a building, and so I was in Alex's group, and you know what we did as far as vision goes? Alex goes, I will do, I will do, a, I, will do I will just do your part of the group, and then you just research skyscraper. Cool, I'll do that. So I researched a skyscraper. I'm not suggesting you guys do that. I'm just saying that's one example, and then we ended up winning the skyscraper. It used to be two, a, ten, a team of two and stuff like that. But we had some vision going into that, right? Like, you should start thinking about your thesis second or third year. I really think so. I, it's gotta be like a, a deep, a, if you really wanna win and you want it to be meaningful for yourself, or, or be a finalist, or just meaningful in general, it's got to come from like a personal, spiritual sort of place. I think. It's got to really be solve some social, cultural problems in that kind of way. And the people who are most disadvantaged maybe have that opportunity to do that. Um, so what do we do once we finally get there, right? We've done our thesis, we've graduated, we've got a job because we listened to Lance. Um, we made our portfolio on the, on the winter break. We went on the spring break and didn't go to Cancun, and we interviewed all over the place, and we got a job. What do we do once we're there, right? Well, you don't ever get to quit learning. Like, that's part of being stoic in the Marcus Aurelius sense. It's like, I'm an architect, and I never get to stop learning. And I actually have to learn, I think, maybe even more than some of the other equivalent professions, like doctor and lawyer. We have to learn about that. That's huge. 
that's so huge. Like when you're thinking about even these uh, studio projects that you're doing in school, it's like you're trying to get to know the client, right? You're trying to, this metaphorical, like not real client. This, I, I recommend this book to everybody. I interviewed this author on our show maybe three years ago. And uh, about halfway through the episode, I pulled up my phone and I go, I just downloaded your, I just bought your book on Audible. He's like, oh, thanks. I was like, well, I, like, you just convinced me, you know, this is what it was. The primary reason why I actually bought it is because my, my first wife said, you don't, have any, you don't have any empathy. And I was like, I don't really believe that because it seems like the way I understand it is different. I read the book and I was like, oh my God, I actually have a ton of empathy. She was confusing sympathy with empathy. I don't have a lot of sympathy for people who don't, you know, act in a positive way no matter their negative circumstances. But I, uh, I have plenty of empathy. So I highly recommend as a budding professional, now or sometime, you pick up this book, train your empathy. Having empathy is not a weakness. Having empathy is a superpower. You can control the room in like a passive way. It's amazing. The language this book gives you to use, how you can reflect thoughts back to people, how you can understand people. You will be a better architect. You'll be a better husband. You'll be a better wife. You'll be a better person. You'll be a better everything. I promise. Uh, if any of you are thinking, you know, one day I want to own my own firm also, this is the group to go to, the Entree Architect community. It's not the AIA. AIA doesn't give a shit about small firm architects. I am one, okay? I promise you. These are the people who care about small firm architects. It's literally for small firm architects. Mark LePage is one of, my, one of my best friends. I could text him right now. He's the founder of this. I've been on the show multiple times. He's been on my show. This is exactly what I had been waiting, I've been wanting, like my whole life going up, leading up to be an architect is like, why are these other architects holding all their information about how they practice so close to their best? But like, why aren't we sharing? Why aren't we trying to collectively make the profession better as a customer first, a customer service based business first and foremost? We know we're gonna do the pretty stuff. We know we're gonna do the cool buildings. Like that's just a given, that's all we're doing here, right? But how do we become better business leaders and, and better at life? You go to the Entree Architect community. I already talked about meditations with Marcus Aurelius. Read the book. It's phenomenal. I don't care if you're male or female. This will change your life. Um, <clears throat> end card. The only reason I have it out there is because I was actually surprised I had to even talk about this. Uh, this summer, um, I went camping with uh, this group of uh, architects in Minnesota. And they went all, most of them went to the U of M. I don't think we have this problem here, but I want to make sure we don't have this problem here. Half of those architects, you couldn't even actually call them architects. Like, you legally can't call them architects. For some reason, they were just like, we're not getting licensed. Why? Like, what, like, what, like a, as a contrarian, as somebody who also was like, at one point in their lives, kind of wasn't too enthusiastic about licensure just because it was so hard to get there. And I went through, I, I got there in like a very uh, uh, non-traditional way. Get your license. Get your license. Go th and do the right thing with NCARB. You, 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 the doors it opens up for you. The ace it'll give you in your hand over here is amazing, especially like if you want to go practice in a different state, I can go practice in almost every, I won't practice in New York or California because you had to take extra tests, I'm done with them. But if I was, but I, we've been licensed in Tennessee, North Dakota, Idaho, Wyoming, and it takes like two weeks every time. And I don't lose business or anything like that. It's just so valuable. Please, please, please focus hard. The other thing that licensure does for you besides just giving you that title and giving you this golden key and everything is, it's the last part of your quantitative reasoning you have to do. It is 100% quant quantitative reasoning exercise. And I have seen in my firm people that be were from unlicensed to licensed, like the leap it actually does for them to actually just think about hard problems and interpret codes, which are tricky sometimes, and fight with the building regulators and all this other stuff, huge. Um, I actually gave this book out. So some of you already have this. I think you already read it, hopefully, right? Uh, seven, Hab seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's a classic. You gotta read it. Uh, if I was teaching here again this semester, I would have done the same thing. I would have given that gift. Our whole firm has read the book. Um, we do one book a year. This last year we did uh, Pattern, Pattern Language, Christopher Alexander. Um, huge, huge book. Some people, you, you guys might, a lot of you might already be doing a lot of this stuff. Good. I know, I know when I read the book like two years ago, I was like, yeah, I'm kind of already doing all that. There's, but there was one thing I picked up, I can't remember what it was, but I was like, oh, one thing still worth the read. 
Um, economics in one lesson, that might be a curveball for everybody, but I think it's super important, especially if you want to be one of these people. If you want to be one of these people um, who is either an owner or a principal or somebody who's in charge of hiring people and bringing work into the firm, guess what? Once you, once you get that reward of the money and the prestige and everything else, then there's the risk, right? And what's the risk? Ah, got to make sure everybody's eating. <laughs> I'd hate, to, I'd hate to lay off Joe and make him cry. You know, nobody wants that sort of thing. So you need, to, you need to actually know a little bit about economics. You need to know like what's going on in the macro environment, what's going on in the micro environment. How is money actually created? How do I use money to my advantage? How, do, how it can it be in a disadvantage to me? Huge, huge book. I, I gave this to my firm too, I think like four or five years ago, they all read it. We can all kind of talk the same language. And this last one is maybe one of the most important. Like, I have noticed this as someone who hires people that come, you know, brand new people out of many different universities, not just this one. Uh, you should be doing this almost at every single lecture, at every single meeting, a lot in your life. This should be your best friend. It should always be your best friend. I see some people doing it already. Uh, bravo, thank you for like taking the notes. Susan's doing it. It's huge. It's kind of everything once you get to practice. People used to tell me, um, there's, I used to make a joke when I taught a certain course at CU Boulder. And I'd bring out a big set of drawings, set it on the table, and uh, I'd unroll it and stuff. And I, would, and I would show the students how to properly roll it up, which is the drawing should be facing outward. Because once we lay it down then, then it doesn't roll up. Everybody's not mad at us, right? And I would joke to them, I'm like, you do that the first day, your boss is gonna be impressed. But now we don't even have blue, we don't even have like instruction documents except for one set in the field, it's all blue beam. So now the joke is, is like, if you show up with a sketchbook and take notes the very first day, your boss is gonna be impressed. If you show up the second day and you do that, and the third day, all of a sudden it's a habit. This is just part of what you do. I am, I am still having to teach people that who come in from good universities, it's okay, I've accepted that this is part of my deal, but I'm trying to preemptively tell you guys that before you go out and fly full time after grad school. Please, don't ever forget that your sketchbook is your best friend and you gotta be taking the notes, okay? You, if, you, you could like supersede people in the firms. Like I could totally see that happening if there's a counterpart that's not taking those notes. You could like save the day one day, as a matter of fact. Like you could probably save a litigation at some point. Very, very important to be taking those notes and paying attention and being professional in that way. Like, I can't emphasize enough, you can't retain everything up here. The notes are super important. <clears throat> this is the last slide. I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, so back to like the chess game, right? It's really up to you what you do with all this information, who you are, where you're at, how you, how you, how you react to your situation. If anybody has followed me on LinkedIn, they'll notice, what are Lance's preferred pronouns? Lance's preferred pronouns are positive reactionary. That's kind of what I've like, decided to define myself as, right? Like, I made the mistake of having a child at 20, which put me up against odds for that. I came from a family that was lower economically, big time. I came from a family that never went to college, right? Like, I had plenty of disadvantages, right? But I turned all of those things around into a positive light and thought about it in that way because now at 41, I can finally define it. Like, Oh, that was the law of polarity. Duh, nobody had told me that. Well, I'm telling you that. You don't have to be 41 to know that, right? You could be 20, 22, whatever it is. So it's up to you. Like, you can listen to all the bad stuff on the news. You can see the circumstances around you and feel like the whole world is against it and be the victim. Or you can take that little pawn piece, that little pawn, and go all the way over to the other side of the board, and you can become the victim. You can become the king and queen. It's all up to you, okay? That's all I got. Questions? There's none, that's okay too. Yeah, Avina. What attributes do you find to be a very strong attribute to have when you start working? Like, is it having a strong yeah, oh, great question. Yeah, I'd say it's like three things. It's like three things. I think you have to be punctual. So just showing up a few a few minutes before starting time is very important, actually. 
Um, staying just a few minutes late is, is okay too, but like being on time to meetings, being punctual. The second one is communication. Like that is so huge. And, and that's, and like, I'm gonna dive into that one a little bit more even. One of my big critiques against architects and why I actually, we our firm ends up winning a lot of work from these other architects in Colorado is because I have a lot of formerly, like they fire their architect or they've worked with another architect and already have a bad taste in their mouth from that former architect or engineer or whatever. And I go, well, what was like, what is one thing you wish that architect were gonna improve on? And like, they were so bad at communication. And I go, what do you mean? What do you mean? We've got this. It can text. It can FaceTime. We've got email. I can call you. And they're like, I would email them. It would be like weeks before they get back to me. They wouldn't call back in like two or three days and stuff like that. So being a rapid communicator is that will just that's just like again back to the basics. Like what a basic thing to do. That did, that requires <laughs> all that required is just being punctual and disciplined with my communication in that kind of way. You would be a huge breath of fresh air to your clients and the profession at large if if we all started moving in that direction. That is a really big problem with it. And then back, like the Nate note taking, really taking diligent notes is so important. Like at our firm, we form a triangle for every project. Um, so there's me up here, the administrator, and then there's project architect, and then there's a drafts person, entry level type of person, recent grad type of thing. They're not licensed yet. Um, they're called designers, and. <coughs> The, it's the project architect's job to run the meeting, so they don't have time to take notes. And then it's me, the administrator, observing and interjecting, and honestly, like, that's not my job to take the notes, it's the designer, it's you that are gonna be coming out of school. Taking those notes, formulating them, reminding the project architect who already has so many things in their brain, like, oh yeah, but by the way, I know we addressed you know, X, Y, Z's, A, B, C, D, E, we forgot about F. You'll save their butt. Like, you can make them look like a hero in front of the client. So I think those three things are just so fundamental um, and, and huge in that kind of way. Good question. Very good question. Who else has a good question? Now I go to bed early like an old man. Yeah. Way early. Like, uh, eight or nine. I'm not joking. I tell, yeah. I get my full, I get my full eight. When I was in college though, I think you have more stamina, right? So I don't want to discourage, I don't want to suggest that you guys are going to bed at nine or 10, something like that, like, trust me. I, that's why I said like, I was the first to studio, so six, eight, you know, six, seven a.m. before anybody got there. Then I got my golden hours in, I got all this stuff ready. And guess what? I was prepared for like even the professor. So the professor would come up and I'd be like, let's, I want to talk about this, 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 this. And, and we would talk about it and we would address it and we'd, we'd be done for the day, we'd move on, right? Like it was very professional. The same thing I mean, it goes for practice then, right? Think about it in that way. Like, We try to train our entry level employees to consolidate down to those sort of lists in that way of like, so now, with like, for example, what they, what they do is between eight, on, like on Monday, for example, uh, between eight and 8.30, we have a big staff meeting. Everybody gets, everybody, we make sure everybody's assigned for the next two weeks, what they're doing, where the triangles are formed and all the things. From 8.30 to nine, that's the opportunity for those designers to ask the PAs questions. But the PAs now have demanded, and I love it, because we sort of, we, like they were getting anxiety, because they were like, well, they'll ask us a question every five minutes, like I can't even draw, like I, I can't even draw my building. I'm like, well, we gotta consolidate it. So let's just try to train them to have all the things ready to talk about in that first half hour, and then, then it's a focus time from nine to 12, Take your lunch, focus time again, and then the last set of questions at the end of the day. But it's, it's, see how analogous it is to studio? Like if you did those fundamental like ways to do it, trust me, your professors will be happy as one who is an adjunct if you just have a nice consolidated list for us to go through and we're just kind of like steering the meeting in that way. It's good practice for running a meeting um, in that way too. But back to the staying up late, sorry. Uh, I would stay until like, till like midnight or one and get my like five or six hours of sleep in. But that's a, what, you're a d way different person at 22. At 40, it just doesn't happen anymore. I mean, you got, we gotta recharge. Uh, it's just, we're just different animals. I mean, wait till you're 25, like the hangover starts to get pretty intense, <laughs> yeah. Good question. Um, question. Yeah. How do you like combat like burnout? Especially during like school, awesome you still question. experience burnout still? Or oh yeah. Like, Oh yeah, I'm experiencing, I'm actually experiencing it right now. 
Okay. Not, not during this presentation because I love talking, <laughs> especially you guys. Uh, I, for the first time, as, as we're a younger firm, so we're only like 15 years old, and we've, like, we, we're very organically grown. We're not really, we're, we're becoming more corporate. And as we become more corporate, as I'm moving people up to the ranks, people have been there for a very long time, and they're project architects. I have heard from them for the very first time, like, how do you deal with burnout? And I go, okay, there's some fundamental just habits, and I think this even applies to you guys, like right now. I mean, I told my daughter this the other day. She had anxiety about her friend texting her, and she has an iPhone, and so you know how you can, you can see people typing, and you can do the, the read receipts? And I go, Kaya, like, you need to create a space, a safer space for yourself digitally. And I go, they don't need to know when you're typing. They don't need to know when you have a read receipt on. Why I'm telling you about that is because then I, what I told the employees, I go, do you have your, do you have your work email on this? Or, or, or do you have notifications on for it? And he goes, I have notifications on. I go, don't do that. Like, please stop that. Because we're trying to establish a culture of balance at our firm where it's, you know, seven to four, eight to five, 40, 45 hours a week. Why did you move to Colorado? Go play in those mountains. That, you know, for me, that's where I get rid of the burnout. I can just feel it bubbling up sometimes and I'm like, Okay, I need to literally just go ice fishing for a whole week. And maybe maybe check emails a little bit here and there, but like kind of really pull myself out of it. So, you know, a lot of it is personal, but some of those digital habits, I think are probably can start right now. With the text messaging, with the notifications pulling up, like maybe silencing your whole phone in the sense of like, even if you have like Insta or Facebook on there, taking the notifications off and like, you decide when you check open up the app and then you're like, oh, I do have notifications or messages or whatever, and, and dealing with it that way. The other thing is, and uh, I know when you guys came down to Denver, we did this. Um, I think you probably remember too. We would go to the firms and we went to three different firms. Um, we went to RNN, we went to Shopworks, and we went to both of my locations. And I know it's like people are a little timid and they would know, so we, we Someone, like Chad from Shopwork gave us a beautiful presentation. Get to the end, I'm like, he's like, any questions? I'm, look, we're all, I'm looking around, I'm like, come on, you guys. And the question I asked, if you guys remember, one of the ones I consistently asked, even my staff was, how many hours a week are you guys working here? You guys, you remember what Shopwork said? They were gleeful, they were working 60 plus hours a week. They, he, Chad thought that was a badge of honor. Chad thought that was the, that was the best thing to do, right? Same thing for r and They were just so proud of themselves, 50 to 60 hours a week. And then my staff got asked, they go, 40, 45, 40, 45. And are like, you know, it's, it's hard to compare, like, oh, are they doing better work than somebody who's not working that much? Like, is that what they're getting out of it or anything like that? I don't think so. I think they're getting a more stressful life. I think you have to all ask that question when you go interview. You need to ask that question. What's a work week like here? How many hours a week am I working here, honestly? Like, am I, am I expected to work 60 plus hours a week? What's the culture here? And then if, if you can possibly talk to another employee there. Because the principal's gonna tell you, like, I'm gonna tell you the truth, but I don't know about, the, I can't speak to the other principals. They're gonna tell you that kind of stuff. So, I, and I hope, I think that culture is dying out. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, I think we're trying for more balance. Um, that word comes out, I like to think of it as harmony, like work-life harmony. Like on, was it Tuesday morning? Woke up super early, I went ice fishing, I came back down the mountain, I was at work at 10, and I worked for the rest of the day. That was good harmony for me, right? Um, you probably can't do that until maybe you're a principal. The other thing you could ask about too is like, uh, there's this, there's a work from home trend, right? Some people are doing it all the time, some people are not. There are a lot of negatives that happen with the work from home stuff too. Like don't fool yourself that it's just like, this is perfect. I wanna, I want to go to 100% work from home. It's going to be less stressful for me. I don't have to drive. I don't have to do all the other things. But what are some of the negatives that can happen? You know, Alex and I really thought about this deeply. We thought, I think it's kind of a world if we just did all work from home. And we instantly had these grads come in and then siloed them. And they don't get the mentorship that they need, like in person and stuff like that. So don't, you know, think about the work from home. Like, is that going to be more stressful for you? Is it not? Maybe what you're looking for is something like we do, which is work from home Wednesday. So we broke up our week. That was our reaction. That was our positive reaction to the COVID hysteria and everybody's gonna work from home from now on. It was like, 
maybe not all the time, but maybe we there is a lesson here, and it's, it's helpful for people to go do their personal things that they need to do, go get a haircut, have a little bit more relaxing day, break up the week, and that can also help with burnout too. So part of it is also you like finding the place that sort of fits for you and not settling somewhere just because you need a job and, and putting yourself in the position of like, I gotta, I'm happy that I'm working for ShopWorks for 60 plus hours a week. And just looking at the mountains, we're not going there. Um, time the last question a bit. Um, being a thoroughly modern firm, really inspired, I'm sure lots of work on the angles you can have. Do you have any, do you feel your firm approaches shareholders, kind of the way you award shares in a new way, or is there any, are you making, you know, are you finding there's any, that one uh, changing, do you see reason to change it from what's a standard practice to a small practice to a, you know, how have you found that has helped with burnouts or not people's contributors or yeah. what's your experience? An attitude, yeah, right, like how does it affect your attitude? Yeah. Did everybody hear that question? I'll repeat it if you didn't. A little bit, okay. The question is basically, correct me if I'm wrong, is like, how is our firm set up in terms of, of shareholders and then also am I seeing other firms like just through my networking and knowing other firm owners of, you know, do they, do other, <coughs> are employees able to eventually own part of the firm? So it helps with maybe quelling the burnout and stuff like that because they feel like they have more peace, they have more skin in the game themselves, right? I mean, that's part of it. Uh, I do think it's trending that way, at least from my observation. So uh, we haven't established that yet because we're, we're but we're, it's definitely going to be talked about at our uh, quarterly meeting at the end of this year. Me and Al are going to talk about it. Because Al is also a business coach um, for other architects. He's, he has another company. We have too many companies. Builds builderbettercode.com. And so he coaches other small firm architects how to get their profitability up to 20, 30%. And one of the things he's talking about with them it, that he hears a lot is that profit sharing. Profit sharing and just shareholding in general. That's the tricky part about this business is like you hope you start you grab onto some talent at year zero and invest 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 and it's a mutual investment they're investing in you too they're investing literally their time and their life in, in your firm right and sacrifice their sacrifices on both sides you're investing for like seven years and then everybody's probably heard of this right the seven year itch like divorces happen around then um uh, people move jobs around then move houses like there's something so going on with this number seven same thing that happens with employees, you get to year seven. And with architects, it's even more real because then they get licensed too. And then it's like, oh, I guess I'm gonna start my own firm. Al and Lance are making it look easy and stuff like that. So once you get to those established employees, I think you're not probably setting yourself up for success in the future to retain those employees in a kind of society now that we live in, in which job, hunt, job hopping is just constant. It was crazy during COVID, right? So how are you building that loyalty in? And I think in this new era, it is offering shareholding. And that, that, is, that is our plan at some point. But we're kind of at that sort of like in between seven to 10 year with a couple employees in particular that are probably looking in that direction. Um, but that, I don't know how else you hold on to people because at a certain point people become not profitable. Um, then you gotta start putting more people underneath them and then those people maintain the profit and all that stuff. Cause you can, I mean you can keep raising fees until you can't keep raising fees, and then it's like, ah, well, now we're losing work. So there's this weird balance and everything. But incentivizing them, and then hopefully them becoming, once they also have more teeth in the game, because they go, oh, I'm a shareholder, I can get more of the piece of the pie at the end. Well, then I'm gonna become a good salesman or a saleswoman. And I think that's also like sort of the next evolution of that. It's like, if you're making these people into shareholders, you probably gotta start training them into how to sell, right? And then, then I'm probably gonna point him right back to that book again, because that book, that's the craziest thing about like, I, is, uh, I talk to all these, all these people, one of the biggest myths I hear all the time is they're like, well, I can't sell because it's just about being cocky about yourself. I'm like, what are you talking about? It has nothing to do with me when I'm going out and selling our services. I, I am sitting there listening for 45 minutes every, every time, and finally my potential clients will run out of steam, and they will go, okay, do you have any questions for us? Yes, I have a few, just a few, you know. Or, 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 or if I ask them if they have questions for me, sorry, and then they ask me some questions, we kind of wrap up the meeting and everything. It has everything to do with empathy. 
um, as far as sales go. Like, it has nothing to do with you being cocky or confident or just bragging about yourself. Like, that's actually the opposite. You need to figure out what problems they have and how you're, and then, and then your last 15 minutes is how am I going to solve your problem for you? How are we going to solve it better than everybody else? How are we going to over communicate uh, and be better communicators than the other architects? Did that answer? It was good. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Critical thinking. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. Because, like, do you guys know why we have to take the, uh, so you, you get an option here, right? You can take uh, uh, calculus, or you can take some other higher level math, um, and then trig, you gotta take trig, and there's there's some geometry involved, with, you know, but like, I actually, I had to ask the counselor here once, I'm like, why, why, I just wanna do that. Like, why do I have to take all these, these higher level math courses. It's because it's it's called quantitative reasoning, which is literally critical thinking, right? You're you're using you're solving complex equations or at least seeking to figure them out. I'm for some reason, this is the big thing I'm seeing from new grads coming in to our office. It's almost like you just didn't um, have the curiosity that I that I wanted you to have. So I think being just uber, uber curious about the why behind things is, is super critical, right? Um, and then, but there's a balance with that too. Like some people come in and they think they wanna, like if I ask an employee to, you know, maybe it's their first month there or something and I just give them a real simple task and they overcomplicate the task, that's sort of the opposite, right? So it's trying to find that balance. I don't, I don't really have a good answer for you about like how you get to the good critical thinking. Just no, maybe, maybe it's just me saying it out loud. It's like, I need you to be a bit more critical thinker, right? And that, I thought that's what architecture school is about, right? Like, so for example, if, if you come into the firm, whatever firm it is, and I ask you to move a firewall six inches, right? And you do that, you export the PDF, you send it back. I will be disappointed in you because you didn't critically think Oh, is there like a ripple effect? Like, what did that one move mean for the rest of it? And did you maybe save my butt and the project architect's butt and go, oh yeah, yeah. They, they asked me to move it six inches. Oh, I moved it six inches. Oh, affected the door, affected that room, affected this, 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 this. You go through the whole problem, call your project architect over and go, hey, I moved the wall and I just want to show you like, here was the whole effect, but here's how I solved it. And I'll go, oh, cool, I don't have to do that. Great, thank you for that. I thank you for being a critical thinker. Yeah, simple stuff like that. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Good question. Anybody else? Avina, ladies first. Cool. Cool. Um, so it's really interesting in this field. Um, a lot of people talk about like there's similarities or like a borderline of being cocky versus confident. Mm. What? How do you feel about that? There was, there's, there's this guy I follow on LinkedIn, he's hilarious. His name is Anthony Hildewer, I think. He's, he's, a, he's a real smart dude, he's a software engineer, but he's kind of a troll, but he's so funny. And so he posted a uh, vanity license plate just today on there, and it was something like, uh, like go get her or something. And he goes, he goes, is it too cocky? And I go, not if you can back it up. And he go, oh, he's like, I like that answer. That's kind of always been my take on it, is like, am I being cocky? I don't know, like I, I'm literally backing it up here, like, you know, and, and sure, like there's there's gloating in that sort of thing, um, in that kind of a way, but I think what you never wanna do is you never wanna come off like cocky to a, to a client. Um, you know, you're really trying to be just the best listener you can be and the best problem solver. I, I really can't emphasize that empathy part, no. Like it is just so critical to everything we're doing, especially when you're dealing with clients like, we have some very special clients right now. Um, <clears throat> it's, we're doing a very high profile project, uh, project like in the middle of Denver, huge budget, custom house. Um, the wife has ALS and she's deteriorating like so rapidly. It's just like really pulls at me. 
like we got to be the best listeners we can be for her. Like this is her whole life. This is her husband's life. This is her kid's life. Like this is very critical for them um, to just live the best she can be in that kind of way. Like at no point am I being cocky. I'm being, I'm being confident in saying I can solve their problems, but I'm but I'm not being cocky. Um, I think cocky really is. It comes down to that. Is like, am I backing it up or not? Yeah. Oh God, yeah. I, I'm here because I got laid off. What a great like positive and negative story. Uh, when I graduated in 2008, I did get those seven interviews out in Colorado. I interviewed at, at the most prestigious residential firm in Aspen, Studio B Architects. I know Scott very well. He's they do the, they're the best. They've been in Arc Record. They're just amazing. I interviewed with some of the best dev, uh, architects in Boulder and Denver, all that kind of stuff. Um, stayed in touch with those. Uh, I finally got I interviewed in this in spring. Finally got an offer in October because the economy was starting to deteriorate. Great recession was coming. I landed in Boulder, worked for Studio HT for nine months, and got laid off. And I got laid off. And I was like, what it was one of the most devastating days of my life. It's like, oh my god, all the stuff I've talked about here. All that hard work, all like overcoming all of those challenges, some of them I inflicted on myself, and then I'm like subject to that, right? Right? Isn't this isn't this me kind of explaining like, okay, should I just be mad at other architects? Should I just like what do I do with all this like ink? What do I do with this energy? And and it was negative, right? I'm gonna do it like Michael Jordan did, right? Like I grew up in that era, so like that story resonates with me all the time, right? Everybody, you know that story, right? Michael Jordan didn't make his bath, didn't make the didn't make the cut between his uh, junior and senior year. So what did he do? He got mad at himself. He got mad at himself and worked his ass off. And now he's Michael Jordan, right? Then he made the team and did all the thing. I I really used that chip on my shoulder in a positive way. Like I took all that energy and put it in my belly, and it's been like a driving force ever since. And and what's hilarious is like so many times now it's come full circle. Uh, and, and like where I'm like seeing the practitioners who didn't hire me or laid me off and like that first firm that laid me off they're not even they don't even exist anymore they actually disintegrated right so like what was it to me for you to focus on that instead of just like focusing on F9 focusing on Alex growing the firm looking at thinking about ob observing those firm owners and like thinking about okay, why did they lay me off oh what were they doing wrong business-wise? Poor communication, 100%, it was so bad, it was so bad. They were not serving their clients, they were not listening, they were pigeoning and holding themselves into just serving one type of clientele, like the 0.01%, they weren't diversifying their portfolio. They weren't advertising because they thought they were artists and not business owners. They were doing so many fundamental things wrong business-wise that I went like, thank you for all that negativity you showed me. Thank you, like I thank them all the time. I wouldn't have had lunch with them before, thanks Chris. I've told Christopher Hare, like, thank you. Honestly, thank you for all that. Because now that I've done the opposite. Like, I'm just gonna do the opposite, and the opposite is positive. So, if you guys get laid off in that way, ever, ever in that kind of way, I just wanna, like, don't forget about that story. Another good story about, like, look at that negativity. And then, how do you turn that into a positive reactionary um, thing, that, <coughs> thing that you can do for yourselves? That was the one time. Sorry, um, So, kind of going off of that, with like, did you ever hear negative things such as like, if you were talking to somebody, you know, like, I want to start my own firm, and you're like, that's going to be really hard, and blah, 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 and hearing that stuff, did it ever really make you feel defeated at times, where you like, almost question yourself, like, am I going to be able to do this, and like, how did you get over that? Or oh, like, yeah, yeah, and it, some of those things I heard from that former principal I told you about, it's like, <laughs> you know, they, they, they were really mad that we were like, we set our fees lower than than other architects at that time. But I was like, well, we don't have big salaries. Like we don't, like we can set our fees lower than that and win the work in this tough environment and that kind of way. And it's like, it's hard to raise fees. And you're, it's gonna be impossible to raise fees in the future and it's not sustainable and all of a sudden, like those guys are defunct now. So that was one example for sure. That one didn't make me question it though. It, it just kind of reinforced we were doing the right <coughs> thing because they had so many bad practices anyway, right? Um, but all of my, most of my colleagues, my best friends from this university that, that like I graduated with, some of which now actually own firms and are calling me daily for advice, 
they thought we were nuts. They thought we were completely insane to start a firm in the Great Recession. Also, also unlicensed, so we had to be very careful about how we advertise the stuff. And, and that's why I would say we got uh, licensed in a non-traditional way. Like we ended up like teaming up with other architects and, and engineers and, and getting the, all, all the uh, AXP points and stuff like that. But then they thought we were completely nuts. And I just had one of those guys, my best friend, I won't name his name, he came down to Colorado this uh, summer, took him, up, took him hiking, fishing, and uh, we talked shop the whole time, right? And I go, and I was like, I was like, don't you see, like, we're, me and Al, like, renegades, and we just don't operate in your, like, corporate world and stuff like that. And I go, like, no offense, you know, him, well, I'm not gonna say his name, no offense, but, like, we're kind of on this curve up here now, and, like, you're just starting here. And he goes, yeah, you, you were right the whole time. I, sh I should have just started earlier. I should have just started earlier. And that's a, that's a thing I hear all the time from all of these business owners and entrepreneurs and real estate people. Anybody who is like a go-getter and out there and making a name for themselves and, and forging up their own path, there's a question I ask at the end of, end of every episode of when I do these interviews. I ask them, like, going back in time, what is one piece of advice you'd give yourself? knowing what you know now. And like, overwhelmingly, it's been, I would have started sooner. I would have I just started, I would have started sooner. I'm not saying do it like us, unlicensed. It's very, very difficult. Like, it would be a climb a mountain, right? But as soon as, like, as soon as you, you know, get the guts to do it, and you feel like you want to do it, and you have some opportunity, you can see just a little bit crack of open, like an opening in the door, and you can go through, I, I, I recommend it, yeah. Most architects are actually sole practitioners. I don't know if you know that, like 40% are sole practitioners. And then the other like 30% are small firms like us. And then there's the huge Genslers and everything else. So yeah, it's a lot of little people actually. Yeah, you can start this little tab. Okay. Thank you.